We've had a history with slavery in this country dating back to the 1800s and the Civil War, and we have federal laws about that issue related to involuntary servitude and all the laws that came out of the Civil War, like the 13th Amendment. But here's a modern day definition that we can look at and we could all apply in our work. The definition essentially broke trafficking down into three general buckets. Kids in the sex trade, adults in the sex trade by force, fraud, or coercion, anyone forced to work against their will. And the common threads there are people's loss of freedom, people's loss of self-determination, people's loss of the ability to say stop, to say no, to control their own kind of destiny. But there are some myths out there about the issue of human trafficking, right? Some people think that it's only sex trafficking, and they forget to talk about the whole labor trafficking side. Some people think that it's only women, and it's a women's issue. They forget to talk about all the forms of men that are actually victims of human trafficking, construction workers and farm workers and things like that. Some people think that when you hear the word trafficking, it somehow requires movement. She was trafficked from Ohio to Indiana. They were trafficked from Mexico to the US, when actually the law doesn't say anything about requiring movement. Beyond just physical force, to also include all the psychological ways you can control somebody through threats, through debt, through, through manipulating their money, through manipulating their access to their own travel documents, to threatening their kids, to threatening their parents, to just lying to them about making false promises, all those ways you can control somebody, all those went into that modern day definition that's broader than force. We're answering the national hotline all day. We get around 100 calls a day with folks saying, hey, I just found this. Hey, I'm a survivor, how do I get out? Is this the number I call? And we're sitting there 24 hours a day answering those calls. And so we have our finger on the pulse of is this happening or not? Pretty much more than most anybody I could think of in the country. And we're here to say, yes, it is happening. It's happening in a much bigger way than most of us realize. This is happening in our midst. And as a community, what's our responsibility to do something against it? From an ethical perspective, what's our responsibility to do something against it? Where do you all fit in? What are some ways to engage with this issue? If it feels overwhelming and you're like, where do I even start? Learn about the issue more. Engage with organizations that work on it. Come to events like this. There's books to read. There's a whole list of books on our website at polarisproject.org. There's movies to watch. There's like 40 movies that we have a list of. And just really begin to educate yourself. I'd say start talking it up amongst your circles. And second, I think I'd really do some reflection, especially while you all are here and with Ethics Week this week, why are we even working on this issue in the first place? and to really try to calibrate your values in the right place of fighting for dignity for folks, fighting for freedom for folks, fighting for equality for folks. You all can play a role in helping to identify survivors of trafficking. Right now, less than 1% of the survivors in the world are getting identified and getting out of their situations. So what we need is we need eyes and ears in the community. The police are actually depending on society to bring the cases to them. I hope that you understand actually what the issue really is from here moving forward. And we've kind of busted some of those myths that are out there. And you're walking out here with a clear lens of what human trafficking is. When you start using those lenses, I think you'll realize this issue is much bigger than we realize. It's not this little niche issue. It's sprinkled in our communities. If I can uh, ask you to turn to the back of your programs, if you do have one, we have a description of the Marymount University Ethics Award, and if you don't have one, I just want to single out some phrase here that I think best represents what the award's all about. It says, the award is presented to leaders who by commitment, effort, and example advance a strong value-based culture. And I think you all would agree with me after this evening, we couldn't have a better representative of this particular award than Brad.